on February the 9th, then we are beginning the safety and security meeting a little late today. Um, we'd like to welcome everybody for, uh, that is here. And we are now calling this meeting to order. Item number two is discussion, consideration, and possible approval regarding excused absences. We have one today, and that's Ms. Allison Palmer. And do I hear a mo motion to approve? To approve. Move to approve. Scott Matthew. Second. Second, James Castro. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Discussion, consideration, and possible approval regarding the December 8, 2022 meeting minutes. Has everyone had a chance to review those? And do I have a motion to approve those? Scott, I'm sorry, I wasn't here, but I'll, I'll move to approve. I, okay, I'll second it. All those in favor? All right. Okay, item number four, updates from the Chief Inspector General, Daniel Guajardo. Well, good afternoon, Chair, uh, members of the committee. For the record, Daniel Guajardo, Chief Inspector General. OIG material starts on page 20 of your board packet. Information is data from the first quarter FY23 of OIG operations, which are September through November of uh, 2022. Overall operations continue with little to no major disruptions. From OIG's perspective, there are no major safety and security concerns which have caused disruptions to TJJD operations. We do recognize the staffing concerns are a continued issue. Um, however, I've been able to work with TJJ leadership to address any major issues as they arise um, and have not seen any obstruction or unwillingness to assist OIG. While there still remains challenges TJJ, with TJJ staffing, OIG has observed that their staffing and uh, that their training gaps for staffing are, are being addressed. Uh, they're keeping up programming um, for committed juveniles. Uh, of course, we continue to monitor I uh, want to touch a little bit on the staffing for OIG Gatehouse. Uh, at this uh, board meeting, we're at 79% of our staffing with 44 positions filled. Uh, normal staffing, 100% is 56. And that's on trend for the last few quarters. Uh, we're just having trouble staffing up those positions and keeping people, keeping people on. Uh, we did have the opportunity to hire two new incident reporting center uh, specialists. Uh, that fills uh, all of our vacancies except one. So once those staff get back uh, through training, we'll be able to um, reduce some overtime or reduce long shifts that our IRC is, uh, is facing. Um, as far as our board materials, you'll see they're slightly different. Uh, and I kind of wanted to, to talk about the structure of those um, and give you the, the details of them because um, they are a lot more informative uh, than they previously have been before. Um, so uh, you will see the OIG data for the board material. So over the last eight to 10 months, I've been working with our analyst to revise what our board report stats look like to tell a better, tell a better story of what our operations really are. And so what I ended up with was a, a longer report, but I think it tells a, a better story and helps us drill down into maybe some questions or some information that board members may be interested on. Uh, dealing with OIG investigations. Uh, so right now it's 27 pages. Uh, 26 is, is most of the report with the definitions page at the end. Um, and I'm just going to kind of go over the structure more, more so than the specific data, just so you kind of have an idea of what, of what we're talking about. And so you'll see the very first page is kind of a general investigative summary capturing our criminal investigations. Uh, this is typical of what you previously saw. Uh, on previous reports, it's kind of general information that has the general categories and the types of cases and the numbers of the facilities, the breakdown, the statutory requirement of us having aggregated and de-aggregated information is the reason for these charts. Um, as we move to the, the next pages, we see kind of a splash page that breaks down 
IRC information a little more detailed, you see actually how many calls IRC is actually getting. These are the actual phones ringing uh, and kind of what those calls relate to. And then on the secondary chart, you will see that uh, we have 3,192 3, um, IRC entries into the database, so incident reports, and it breaks down who is calling those incidents in for us. So you really get to see where the attention is and the, the high call rate to IRC is particularly staff. And then it breaks down again further in those charts. Uh, we break down incident reporting center even further um, by the general reporting category of each of those calls related to the facilities uh, and the numbers, but we also break down where they went after they were called into the IRC. So you will see in the first portion of there what was referred to administrative investigations, which is um, more of an HR Title VII type investigation, what was referred to abuse, neglect, or exploitation, um, and then on and on. OIG is referred to as the criminal side of our operations. Um, what was referred to PREA for uh, PREA awareness and, uh, and tracking uh, and gives you a lot more information about the, the group there. Some of these, uh, there may be some um, uh, formatting issues that we're still working through, but this is, this is a much more informative sheet than previously had been provided of uh, what's going on with the Incident Reporting Center. Uh, as we continue on through the report, then we get into what OIG investigations are. And so this is almost a, a breakout of what the first page showed and gets a little more granular, a little more detailed as far as the suspects and the number of investigations. And for the board's awareness, um, we may have multiple investigations that, that deal with one suspect. So we go by actual investigations, uh, charges, particularly in types of allegations versus an individual person. So you'll see we have 301 suspects who were involved in the 446 criminal investigations that we opened during that first quarter. And then we break down some demographics. Uh, I think we spoke last board meeting. There was a conversation about some demographics and determinant versus indeterminant sentence. And we break down the, uh, the suspect types in those cases there. So you'll see who's a, a male, female uh, adult age, who's a male, female juvenile age, whether they're an indeterminate or a determinate sentence offender, uh, whether they're an employee or whether they're other. It could be a visitor, a contractor, or some other type of person that's not uh, tethered to TJJD. And then the 446 cases that we open, we break those down further using those same demographics. So you really get a, a, a sense of, of what's being worked and where our attention is being focused. Um, and the general category, just to kind of highlight how that breakout happens, if we look at assaults on employees, we had 144, but then we break down what those assaults on employees are, what types of cases. So you'll see assaults on public servant or assaults causing bodily injury separated from harassment of a public servant or harassment of a person in a correctional facility. Uh, this would be the spitting or the chunking. And then the demographics of them as well. So it's a, it's a lot more information than we previously have been have been uh, providing uh, and tells us where where our sticking points are or where our attention needs to focus when we're looking at the data and the stats. Um, again, some of these may be duplicated. We're still cleaning up the formatting. As we move on, then I just show some general trends, trend charts and some trend lines that kind of help tell the story of the, the quarterly information. And these trend charts for next quarter our next board report will be uh, will be a six month uh, expanse instead of three months here. So we'll capture what this month, these three months look like, and what the next three months look like to start giving a better, more realistic, current idea of what the trend is in juvenile justice in our investigation. What I find and what our staff is finding is that the churn of the juvenile justice happens so fast that it's really uh, uh, it's not significant comparing year to year because it's it's uh, things have changed. People have moved on. Kids have, have left. And so looking at it from a three month to a six month perspective gives us a better idea of where we're seeing spikes and where we're having issues uh, and better to address with the TJJ staff as well. And you see official oppression. Uh, that, that's really a kind of a terrible term that we use. It's a penal code offense and it usually captures cases where we deal with excessive use of force. Uh, but the statute is, is a little hard to make because of the elements on it. So we're probably going to change that to actually mean something that is, is a better 
better compared to this data. So you see really the excessive use of force cases, uh, which are very small, eight over the quarter, have trended down this uh, during this quarter. And then you see the assaults on employees, uh, and we break down the assaults and the harassments. And you do see an upward trend on some of the assaultive behavior on employees. These would be bodily injury type assaults. And then you see a, a, a trend that's kind of slightly low on harassments. <clears throat> So these are kind of just, just trend lines. We're still maybe working and tweaking with some of the, the format and the graphics, but this helps tells the, tell the story of what our numbers are looking like for this quarter. Um, and for the most part, a lot of things are trending downward with assaults on other youth. This is youth assaulting other youth. is a data area where we started collecting a little bit more from TJJD. It wasn't required in GAP, but TJD was providing us more information when a youth commits some type of assault or, or, uh, or offensive contact to a staff or another youth, and they go to security, that a security person will refer information to IRC and we're better able to capture the global aspect of what kind of assaultive behavior is going on um, in TJJ. And you see there's a little bit of, a, of an upward trend uh, on that, but the numbers are still relatively uh, low um, in comparison. Uh, same thing with charts on sexual. So a lot of charts, sexual behavior against offenders. Uh, and then we have like a, who are victims in some of these sexual abuse cases uh, and kind of where those numbers are trending. Um, as we get into the next pages, uh, you're actually going to see this is something new and it's very informative. On the very first page, you see what our active investigations look like. Like as of the board report at the end of the quarter, how many active investigations were still in, in uh, process or still being assigned or still or still open. And that helps us manage our caseloads better when we know what our what our volume and universe of cases are. So this next page uh, on the chart talks about what those active investigations are, like where are my cases, who, what are they, uh, what's high and who are my demographics. Uh, and so it's 599 on the first page, but it's 445 here because these are the true criminal investigations. We pulled out uh, directive to apprehend investigations. We're basically just looking for someone who has a warrant. And we pulled out uh, gang assessment interviews because these are just interviews to assess youth. They're not criminal investigations. So 445, and this breaks out what we have open and who they are, who they are against. Uh, and I found this very informative because that is the that is the volume that is there that we still need to address. And uh, our either investors again has got to be more proficient, or I need more staff. And I said, I think this number, as I see more stats over the year, will be able to tell us that story of do I need more staff to address things faster and quicker. And so this is a, a very informative sheet for me to see. Um, then we start breaking down what the special prosecutions unit provides us as far as their disposition on cases, and then what we send them on cases. And there may have been a question last board meeting about uh, determining sentence offenders and who goes to who goes to TDCJ and gets convicted. And so we, we broke down the demographics on this data as well to show how many of these cases are against adults, how many of these cases are against juvenile age, determinant sentence, indeterminate sentence, and really tell the story of who's going where and what cases are, are getting uh, addressed. So, uh, a lot of data analysis when you got to really look at it and, and get an idea of what we have and where the questions come up from here. There's one question I, or one data point I'd like to highlight is on this area, we have taken in consideration. And these are cases that SPU has resolved or resolved another case and everything else is basically taken in consideration for that, that first case. And in most cases, these are cases that are already sent to them. But when they give us notice that they're taking every case into consideration, that includes cases that are still open, that they are aware of, and they're taken into consideration, but they haven't seen, and so we'll close them out. So our number is much higher than what, what uh, SPU tells us their number is, and so we're going to work to refine that number to show what SPU said and what impacted us on the OIG side that never went to SPU, just to make sure the story is true. Uh, and we get into our arrest figures and our arrest charts, and it has the same demographics of adult juvenile arrest and the types of offense we've arrested on. Uh, and then these uh, donut uh, charts that kind of replicate some of that same information. Um, so just more information uh, that kind of tells different things. These charts are for arrests. Um, 
by general type, adult, juvenile, or staff, uh, and then break down to what are um, uh, non-youth, non-offender cases, and then adult juveniles, and then adult, or then juveniles, true juvenile arrest. So we try to break up uh, that demographic as well. Um, we added a, a kind of a security intelligence page to really talk about what our what our gang looks like, our gang footprint looks like. And so that's this next page here. And you'll see that this is data just from the quarter, first quarter of FY23. And so it'll give you the idea of how many confirmed interviews we did, how many suspect interviews we did, and how many that are not affiliated. So a not affiliated uh, is an individual who is kind of hanging around suspected and maybe hanging around confirmed and maybe doing some things that could be related to, to gangs or gang involvement, but hasn't reached the level of us confirming as suspected or confirmed. And so we have that number there. You can see the, the general number uh, 75 um, as far as what we did during the quarter. And then a bubble chart, a donut chart that really breaks down the percentages of the um, uh, types of gangs that we see in our facility. The small chart to the left that has offenses total, that's the investigations that we have against anyone who was confirmed as a gang member and it breaks down their demographics as well. And then we show what the active investigations I talked about previously in the active investigation sheet that I had pulled out gang intelligence assessments. This is where we kind of add that number back in to show how many interviews we, we're doing during that quarter and where those interviews are, are happening at. Uh, we have seen an uptick in the SIO activity, mostly because we've restructured uh, in December uh, and over the fall, we were restructuring, and our SIOs are now more involved in the SIO gang assessment business than trying to work criminal investigations. So we really refocused them, and we're starting to see some more um, work product. Uh, we are down one gang investigator out of our Ron Jackson, so we have a rotation of investigators that go there to do those assessments. Uh, so that, that also is uh, impacting our number a little lower. Um, and so uh, that's most of the criminal, it's most of the gang stuff. And we, we replicate the same feel and format for our abuse, neglect, and exploitation investigations on the state side and on the county side. So when you go through the chart, you're going to see the same type of grid format that shows, that shows how many cases we've opened, what we've opened, where those investigations are coming out of during that quarter. Um, we'll also have a chart for contract care. Uh, Right now, it's a bunch of zeros of contract care. We do have cases in contract care. Uh, this chart probably needs some adjustment to make sure we capture those. They're captured in a different area. And then some bar graphs that show, you know, the level of confirmed, undetermined, or unfounded is it dis investigative dispositions of, of state cases. And then again, some more trend lines that are trying to help tell a good trend story uh, to help us point to where we have some issues. Um, and so we see that on the abuse state side. Uh, there's a sheet in there that talks about administrative investigations uh, and what those are. Administrative investigations could be anything from a human resources investigation on uh, sexual harassment or discrimination to an internal affairs investigation that I conduct on our own staff for policy violations. Uh, could be an investigation direct by the um, executive director asking if I could assist in some unusual type of investigation. And we refer to those as administrative, and that's where we capture uh, those cases. And right now, it's, it's mostly the HR uh, investigation referrals that we have uh, on that list. And we go down uh, again further into the county, and the same, uh, the same format at the county investigation, where we're showing the number of cases open, closed um, at the county level. And it's two sheets because there's a lot more cases open at, at counties. Previously, you, you had this long list of counties and, and charts, and it was very hard to read. It's very hard to understand. We've, we've uh, taken that off of the board report, but we've made that available on our website to where we're going to publish the complete list that you previously saw in case anybody wants to go to the website and look up a particular county and see if they have any activity during the quarter. Uh, it just made it a lot cleaner and, and uh, easier for us to do it that way. Um, again, some more bar charts on the, on the confirmed side. Um, and donuts to help kind of talk about the, uh, the OIG dispositions uh, on cases, and then also talk about what the local dispositions were when a, a facility did an investigation 
uh, and what they did with their staff, whether they reprimanded them, terminated them, um, or we still have some pending administrative leave, uh, those kind of employee dispositions. And then some more investigative trends uh, as well uh, on, on going on that. And then the final page just talks about the, the types of serious incident reports IRC receives from the county and where those break down. And you can see that we get majority of grievances and the majority come from um, uh, post uh, uh, pre-adjudication detention, uh, 607. And then the final page is just a definition page that kind of talks about the definition of the things that we see as far as our disp dis uh, disposition definitions for abuse, neglect, and exploitation, our administrative investigative disposition, our criminal investigative disposition, dispositions, and then what SPU uh, provides us um, as well. And so they, that wraps up the 27 pages. And there's a lot of information in there. And I'm sure when we all start looking at it, there'll be a lot more questions. Um, but I wanted to kind of give you the structure as quickly as possible, that that's kind of where we're moving towards so that we have a better story to tell. Um, I would be glad to answer any questions about this. I have a one briefing on, on some gang data, because I think we're gonna hear from Dr. Norton soon. Um, and want to kind of talk about what the current gang numbers look like for us. Um, and, uh, and I can close out with any questions or anything I could try to explain on the, on the reports and charts uh, that we provided and we're presenting. No, it's a lot. Yes, sir. Uh, Chairwoman. Yes. Scott Matthew. Uh, Chief Guajardo, first of all, I just want to say thank you for your work on, on, on making, um, it's, it's a lot of information, but it's going to really help this board and all of our stakeholders to understand where we're going and how things are, are progressing. It's also transparent, and sometimes that can be pain, painful. Uh, but I love to see the, the county's information is on there because it holds us to a higher standard. Uh, so really grateful for the work that you've done. I know you and I have talked quite a bit offline uh, about this. And, and my goal as chair for, for, for each committee is really to have a conversation. After these reports, have a conversation and be able to talk a little bit about um, what, what some of these things mean, what these trends mean. So thank you for that. Thanks, sir. Thanks. Job well done, and I know we had asked you at, uh, about some of the stuff that you've incorporated into the report. To give us a, more of a snapshot of what's going on, and and you know, in looking at this, looking at the state level and also the county level, everybody's trending exactly the same way because we're dealing with the yeah. same type of kid. Yep, yeah, that's that's kind of what we're seeing as we start looking at it as well. Yes, so uh, moving that way. But it looks good. Thank you very much. Okay, same thing. Um, I got one more piece. And then... I do have one more question. Yes, sir. Yes. Sorry, I don't want to belabor things, but and I know this is more for finance committee. But you talked about being 80, 82 percent staff. Se uh, Seventy nine for, for our for our gatehouse for our gatehouse position. And, and is the issue? I want to make sure that gets out for the public <clears> to understand. <throat> is the issue um, that we're not able to recruit folks based on our starting salary or the salary that you can offer? Uh, that's the primary issue. The ones that have left recently uh, have left because they were getting better pay. Um, TJJD did give us some money that we did give out raises at the beginning of the fiscal year um, and bumped them up to a, a, a starting salary close to what a JCO starting salary would be. Um, but yeah, we have, we have trouble retaining, bringing on people at that level um, because of the salary um, for that security officer level. Um, on that. And then they leave because they could make more money. Some have returned back to facilities that they had retired from because facilities recruited were recruiting them back uh, as well. So it's kind of everyone's swimming in the same pool almost sometimes. I gotcha. And Chandra has uh, provided some to help, but we have that's number one on our excep exceptional items list. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, OIG's uh, for peace officer salaries is uh, is number one on, on TJJD's exceptional item list uh, to fund our peace officers at the um, sal Schedule C level that other peace officers are in the state of Texas. Thank you. Uh, so I, I know we're going to hear from Dr. Norton, so I just want to kind of give you some numbers uh, that, that kind of you can see what the overall number looks like as of this week. Um, and Dr. Norton's probably going to present on some gang intervention efforts that we've been, we've been working collaboratively on and trying to, trying to build a little more capacity. Um, and uh, these numbers are from earlier this week, so they may have changed, but uh, we have a total population of 926. That's in secure, halfway house, parole, 
contract care, uh, roughly the number that would be pulled. Um, 591 of those are in secure confinement uh, and 57 are in halfway house. So OIG has interviewed and assessed about 41% of that 591 um, of juveniles for gang assessment. So that's 245 out of the secure population and 21% of the halfway house, which is about 12. Uh, that's how many people we've actually talked to, not that they're all documented, but we've actually gone out and talked to them and try to assess their situation. Sometimes these are multiple talks. I mean, sometimes the juvenile is not gonna tell us their life story on the first, first run. We have to sit back and watch and we have to go back in and interview them again once we've gathered more information and know a little bit more about the history. Um, currently in secure confinement, uh, there's 20 confirmed gang members. There's roughly 3% of that secure population. Uh, there's 80% or 1880 suspected gang members, roughly 14%. And then we have like 100 that are non affiliated. We talked about, I mentioned that earlier, these youth that kind of are hanging around the environment, but not yet confirmed or suspected. And so uh, the, right now, the gang number for confirmed, which is, which is the number a lot of people are interested in, is 20 that are in secure confinement uh, at this moment. Um, let's see, overall, through the whole system, TG, or OIG has interviewed 39%, of 360 of the 926 total population. Um, and then in the system overall, there are 28 confirmed, which is roughly 3% again. Um, and 94 suspected, about 10%. Um, and I don't have uh, 170, 122 of uh, non-affiliated, which is about 13%. Um, and that's the, that, that number of 3% or 5%, those have somewhat been the trend for the last few years on confirmed gang members. Uh, you know, it takes the Code of Criminal Procedures. We have a requirement to, to do certain things before we can confirm them. We are looking at uh, what does it look like when a youth comes into the system who's already been confirmed and he's already in somebody else's system as a confirmed gang member. How does that look on our databases? How do we track it? And so we may have some changes in our data as we start pulling from those other resources of other security intelligence systems across the state that may be documenting their own gang memberships for their local communities. Um, so I kind of want to present that as we segue into to the next presentation, but that concludes my prepared remarks. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, we're on item number five, updates from the Director of Integrated Treatment and Intervention Services, Dr. Evan Norton. I believe my slides begin on page 206, but that was looking at a phone, so I don't know <laughs> if it's different for you all. 205. 205? Oh, that's pretty close. So, uh, good afternoon. For the record, my name is Dr. Evan Norton. I am the agency's Senior Director of Integrated Treatment and Intervention Services. I'm here today to present on the agency's efforts to address the risk associated with antisocial peer groups, uh, commonly referred to as gangs. Uh, I want to thank Chief Bojardo for his partnership in providing effective assessment and monitoring of youth trends and risk. This effort would be ineffective without a partnership between OIG and the staff within our secure settings. It became apparent while we were building this model that the agency needs to be intentional and tactful about how to reduce this risk. Uh, most research suggests that really addressing this risk is best done in community settings. Uh, and we should be addressing the risk factors that lead to gang involvement, not necessarily um, highlighting the harm that gangs cause. Uh, so for slide two, uh, you'll see the conversation around adolescent gang involvement is it, pretty muddy and the research is, is the same. The last significant push in publications on this topic of, of research really came in, in the 90s, the sort of super predator uh, era. Even the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention uh, last published a comprehensive gang model in 2009. So there's not been a lot of, of modernized research on this. And often society's perceptions of gangs within the community doesn't accurately reflect what criminal justice data tells us. This is especially true for adolescents, as Chief Bojardo mentioned, uh, the number of youth confirmed to be gang members within secure settings is, is lower than often people assume. 
Uh, data from youth self-report in the community shows a small portion of adolescents report being involved with a gang in some capacity, and as, as that first point says, but they're also of some of the highest risk to join gang activity as well. So it's sort of a, a catch-22 in a way. Uh, at that first bullet really said, note, notes that there's about 40% of gang members within uh, ur urban settings report being under the age of 18 years old. So it's certainly a heightened risk uh, profile as well. On uh, slide three, you'll see that involvement in gangs is, is really a lifelong venture. Many adolescents receive uh, interventions from criminal justice settings uh, that allow them to sort of separate themselves from gang involvement into their 20s. The, the real peak time for gang involvement in adolescents really sits around that 15 years old mark. Uh, and that's really why, again, it's so important that we have the interventions uh, established in the community and within our secure settings. On slide four, you'll see research really, again, recommends that community-based efforts are the most effective when looking to prevent adolescent gang involvement. So as we began to build this out, we realized that ultimately this can't be something that exists exclusively within secure settings. This needs to be something that transpires and takes place across all of our continuum, whether it be probation, parole, secure. And so we really want to highlight that adolescents are drawn to gangs for much different reasons than maybe adults are. Some of the main things that literature finds is it's, it's reasons and, and rationale like safety, uh, access to resources, and uh, connection, older peer groups, family involvement, things of the sort. So the interventions need to look much different. Uh, interestingly enough, for adolescents, a lot of research has found that community risk factors weigh more heavily upon a person's uh, likelihood they'll engage in a gang than their own personality factors, meaning so community resources, violence within the community, all that has a higher likelihood of predicting someone's involvement in gangs than maybe their own personality traits would be, which is sort of a shift in a lot of the way we conceptualize it. And again, low levels of perceived school safety and parental support are some of the biggest predictors of gang involvement for adolescents. So all, all this to say, the eight, addressing adolescent gang involvement can't really begin or end in secure care, but we need to be intentional about the way that we build this out within our continuum. And so on slide five, uh, this is how we're going to attempt to begin to address this within secure settings in, in an effort to bleed this out across the continuum. And so what, when, when looking at the research and, and how we conceptualize dosage models, uh, it's very similar to how when you have a headache, your doctor doesn't prescribe you the most significant painkiller. It's usually something that's meant to be leveled towards the need that's, that's present. And so we have uh, started with what we were calling our, our first tier, our initial dosage. And so uh, starting shortly, all male youth at the orientation intake unit are going to be receiving the first dosage of gang prevention curriculum. Uh, this will be facilitated by my mental health professionals. Uh, it's an open group format of about 10 sessions that really is focused heavily on the risk factors that lead to future gang involvement, decision making, peer groups, things of the like. What's exciting about this as well is we're going to be focusing on a more gender responsive perspective for our girls within our care. And, and we're really lucky to have partnered recently with the Girls Empowerment Network, who were awarded a, a sizable grant by the Office of Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention to build out and norm a, a program that really uh, attempts to get at self-resiliency, self-efficacy, all the all many of the risk factors that associate with gang uh, intervention as well. And so we're, we're in the process of, of building out what that program would look like, but it'll be more tailored and, and gender responsive to the girls within our facilities as well. So it won't look the same. And I think that's an important caveat. When we, that's every youth. So starting at a certain point this spring, every youth will receive that initial dosage because we know as the research shows us, all youth under the age of 18 are at high risk for gang involvement to some degree, especially those into our city. Then our partnership with OIG, this is where that really begins to take place. Uh, for a long time, there wasn't a lot of communication between OIG and especially our, our treatment programs. And so what we've identified is, is youth who have been assessed as having a, a top three risk factor for criminal associates by our, our, our packed risk assessment and have been confirmed by Chief Bojardo's team will be receiving a secondary dosage of intervention when they complete their capital and serious violent offender treatment programs. So that will look like an individual who's been identified by a chief's team. Uh, we've noted that they're a high risk uh, for um, one of their top risk factors is criminal associates. They'll be receiving additional treatment uh, specifically on those risk factors in that domain uh, that's relevant to, to them as well. So uh, again, really trying to focus that intervention more towards where the need is necessarily. 
And then our, our final uh, tier, our most intensive intervention will occur for those youth who find themselves within our violence intervention continuum programming, who have an additional uh, risk need associated with this as well. So uh, more partnership with Chief's team and, and then my treatment providers as well. Uh, we're gonna be really focusing this to be, again, trying to meet and uh, adapt to the risk that's present uh, in, a, in a tiered approach, uh, similar to a lot of public school settings, you sort of a tiered uh, approach and a dosage model as well. And that concludes my prepared remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions. Madam Chair. Yes. It's a terrific job. Thank you for bringing this to us. Um, shoot, you guys have so many different populations within your population. So, um, but just getting into the weeds a little bit. So, when you talk about um, safety, resources, and connection, what falls in the resources? What does that mean? Great question. Uh, typically, that means money. For, for the most simplest way to, to phrase that. Money, I'm trying to yeah. get money. It, it, it's, it's sort of like a lot of the reason we saw so much adolescent crime really boom during COVID is, is there, you know, people weren't able to work or people weren't able to leave their homes, things like that. And so mm -hmm. the, the simplest way to put it is money and, and food and things like that are resource. Okay. And going to your slide on your tiers, and you talk about all, all, all youth male, you know, they're going to get the education at intake. So intake day one, I'm there, I'm, you're taking my inventory. What does that mean? Does that mean within 72 hours, three weeks? What is intake? When did it start getting your change? Our intake process is typically around 30 days. They have to meet with a, a number of people day one, right? We have to do suicide risk assessments. There's a lot of pre or prison rape elimination act stuff that occurs. That's not a good time to start. Right. And so we want to give them a couple of days to really get settled. And what's nice about the way our education, our, excuse me, our ONA processes, our orientation and intake process is happening now is that our mental health professionals actually have almost like a schedule block during education. And so during that time, my clinicians currently are providing you know, basic coping skills, basic life skills. And so we're going to be sort of replacing that time period with um, content more related to risk that could you know, involve the future gangs. That also has this, you know, it's not sort of a one size fits all uh, perspective. These skills we're going to be focusing on that are related to gang have wide reaching implications as well. Good decision making, thinking your choices through, understanding risky situations. Those are all things that really all of our kids could benefit from as well. So you, you, you started going into the, my last question for you. So interesting. So the education, is that something that you and your team have developed or are we pulled off the shelf somewhere that some other... Evidence-based units are using. I'm torn between two evidence-based programs. I don't want to name them just yet, but they're both open groups, 10 sessions, a lot of um, use of technology, which is something that our kids really appreciate. There's an integration of videos, things like that too. So I'm torn between two, but they are both evidence-based programs, not something Maybe created. Maybe two months, three months from now. We'll be able to tell you exactly which one, yeah. And, and sharing with our county partners as well what we're using. Dr. Norton, will there be a focus on the female population for trafficking that's attached to gang involvement? So intertwined, right? Gang involvement, human trafficking, is, is, and, and really our girls' mental health needs are all so intertwined. It's hard to sort of delineate what's what. Uh, what I really like about what the Girls Empowerment doing are doing is, uh, if anyone's familiar with the Girls Circle kind of programming, it's so so similar. The, 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 the things that they're trying to address in their programming and what they're working on us in should have some, some implications beyond just self-efficacy, self-resilience, and coping. I really do believe there's, there's quite a bit of overlap there. Uh, I don't believe that it's been formally like, stamped for, for trafficking survivors, but I, I do believe there could be an opportunity for overlap there. Thank you. I know in our female program at the county level, we, for the females, we've had to piece together from here and there because you have their victims, but they're also offenders, and you have to create something special for them. Yeah, it's it, especially with gang mm -hmm. things. It, there is no one answer to this this and this thing, and, and that's why I like so much how the, the research is really focused on. It needs to be focused on the risk, not the hey kid, don't do that. Right, right, and that's why it's so important. And, and the reason why you know young ladies may join gangs is, is not the same as why our male population may. Okay. Anyone else? Can you elaborate on those two differences? Absolutely. So we see often that women, or so the young ladies in our programming, are uh, have a much higher rate of exploitation uh, by older uh, male peers. Uh, there's uh, often 
cultural and societal differences that sort of play a role in, in how girls are meant to present themselves and what their roles are within gangs. I, I think that in a lot of ways, we've seen, the research has shown that if you tailor interventions in helping girls create safe connections, safe relationships, there's a larger payout than sort of your classic criminogenic risk focus. And so uh, the Girls Empowerment Network can probably speak to that a little better than I can, but it is important that we, we highlight that there needs to be resources at each step of our continuum, not that they just get this insecure and then move on. And so I, I envision what the girls programming may look like is more focused on sort of safe living environments, uh, opportunities for them to maybe move away from any kind of trafficking situations they may have been in before. And that sometimes includes like not access to certain uh, electronic devices or social media, things like that. That the boys, we just tend to see more, more violence. There's more of a focus on a coping need, uh, and there's also a little bit more integration of um, peer social hierarchy concepts as well. So very convoluted, but there are some kind of key differences that what should be guiding a lot of our intervention. So do you think there's any difference in what the girls need, the boys need, in terms of gangs versus individuals in general? Hmm. Think, a female, a male, right. what our needs are. Is it the same thing? We just take it into a game? Mm. I think needs vary, right? Everyone has their own sort of set of, of needs. I, I think a lot of research would suggest that the rationale of the reason why young, young women enter gangs is, is different than why um, men enter or boys enter gangs in adolescence. So I, th I think it's, it's sort of a, often a chicken before the egg conversation too. All right. Thank you very much. Sure. Great presentation. Okay, we're on item number six, presentation from the Special Prosecution Unit, Ms. Uh, Dana Jones, and she is going to be via video or yes. not. <laughs> yes. she, she is on the internet somewhere, from what I'm told. I hate you. Yes. She is. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And I should introduce myself. I am not Jana Jones, obviously. I'm Jana's uh, uh, colleague, Jack Choate. I am the executive director of the Special Prosecution Unit. And if you're sitting there wondering what the Special Prosecution Unit is, uh, you are not alone because our name really doesn't describe what we do. So I want to say thank you for the invitation to come visit with you about our agency and what our role is give you a little bit of background about how we came to be, what we do, uh, but also more than anything, be available for questions that you might have. And uh, Jana is our, the chief of our juvenile division and I'm gonna hand it over to her for specific questions about some of the day-to-day -day process and how we make decisions on cases that we handle uh, in the juvenile division. But um, to begin with the, the special prosecution unit, uh, I like to think we're called that because I work with a bunch of special people, but I'm pretty sure the legislature's intent was different in calling us the special prosecution unit because what we do is uh, step in for local prosecutors to handle cases uh, arising from within TJJ League, basically. Uh, so we are a statewide prosecutor's office, just like your local DA's offices, uh, and uh, with the exception that we are a statewide office. Uh, and I'm governed as executive director by a board of elected district attorneys that have a, either a TDCJ facility or a TJJD facility uh, in their jurisdiction. That makes them automatically on our board. And then they pick an 11 person executive board every year to uh, actually serve as our advisory board, governing board. So uh, I prepared a handout for you that um, may tell you a little bit more miss anything. I'm, as a lawyer, terrible about sticking through the script. I'm going to do my best, and, and please feel free to interrupt me as I go along here. Um, SPU started in 1984, actually, uh, to combat the rise in violence within the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Back then, gangs were uh, really committing overwhelming violence within the prison units, and, and our small staff of prosecutors went around the state essentially trying capital murders and going after gang members. Um, with the proliferation of prisons in nineteen early 90s, uh, as you know, there are prisons all over the state of Texas. In fact, I've got a little map there from uh, TDCJ that 
every one of those little squares. It's hard to see in this handout, but uh, it almost looks like a Monopoly board with all those little tags. I had no idea until I came to SPU uh, just how many prison facilities there are. Roughly 100, a little bit less than that now. Um, so I have prosecutors located around the state to, to handle those cases with the primary goal of handling cases arising from within uh, prison units or whether they're offenders or staff. Uh, we also have a, a division called the Sexually Violent Predator Division, and these attorneys go to potentially every county in the state. Uh, again, I don't think most people know that we're even doing this. Uh, in 1999, Texas passed a civil commitment statute to where uh, people that are being discharged from TDCJ, if they believe because of a behavioral abnormality uh, do, uh, that they are likely to reoffend, we can pursue a civil commitment for these sexually violent predators in the county of last sex offense conviction. So those attorneys literally go to every county in the state uh, prosecuting those cases as well, um, which is interesting because uh, with that, those are expert intensive cases. We hire experts, basically every forensic psychologist in the state has been vetted by our office that, that testifies in these cases, but it's given us a really great insight into the minds of some of those committing these very violent sexual offenses and, and gives us a little bit better perspective on criminality. Uh, I will come back to that. 2007, uh, we created the juvenile division, and that's what we're here to talk about today, which is our division of attorneys that handle cases arising uh, on property owned or under contract with TJJD. And Jana is the person that, that heads that up for us. Um, and it, again, we have using attorneys that we have regionally based, they're the ones that handle the cases arising from within TJJD facilities. Again, whether it's an offender or, uh, uh, excuse me, juvenile or staff member. Um, just a couple of quick slides on three and four telling you where our government authority comes from. Uh, you will find this in the government code, which actually was passed as part of those 2007 reforms. Uh, and as, as you see there, it's a, an independent unit of prosecutors, but we serve as special prosecutors, again, for those local DAs. Constitutionally, every case that arises in a TJJ facility belongs to those local DAs for purposes of prosecution. Now, we have a good working relationship and they rely on us to, to handle those cases. You can imagine with the TDCJ cases, uh, with those prisons being put all over the state in rural areas, a lot of those DAs don't have the resources uh, or the staff to even handle a, a big docket that comes along from some of the, the cases that we have. Um, on the next page uh, is another article out of the Code of Criminal Procedure that uh, SPU fulfills this obligation by the state of Texas to provide the cost, excuse me, of prosecuting these cases for local counties. And so that's, we are basically the state's answer for that section of the Code of Criminal Procedure. So uh, moving on, uh, I guess if you were to say, why are we special other than serving as special prosecutors? It's because we have this particular niche of a caseload that free world prosecutors don't necessarily get a lot of experience in, and that's prosecuting cases from within a correctional facility. Now, most of this applies more in TDCJ cases because you can't just say TJJD is just like TDCJ. The answer, I mean, that, they're, they're definitely not in the sense that um, you have challenges that TDCJ doesn't have, TDCJ has challenges that you do not have. And so, um, they're very different, but some of the things that are similar, and the reason I put this slide in there is because um, it's issues such as, um, you know, just the, the classification systems, how the, the, the population that are in particular facilities can make a difference as to what, what's going on in that facility. Uh, security threat groups, or what is what TDCJ calls gangs, uh, uh, rehabilitation programs, having those kinds of understanding that culture and those kinds of options that are available for a prosecutor in analyzing cases, the data that's available, uh, makes it very different. And in fact, when we have, uh, I, I keep saying free world DA's offices, but sometimes we serve as sort of a liaison to the local DA's offices and trying to find records and things of that nature that assist them in their own cases. So um, that's, that's sort of why we have this particularly niche 
type of prosecution unit that understands these these notions. Um, obviously, the you know when it comes to TDCJ, the biggest uh, firearm fire uh, is is violence against staff. We've certainly tried cases uh, where correctional officers have been killed uh, or seriously injured. It's a dangerous job. We can never forget that that the people that we are putting in these correctional facilities we're putting them there for a reason, and I think the same is true. Uh, with your facilities as well. Uh, by the time a juvenile has reached a, a TJJD facility, we know in a lot of cases it's because that that kid has had a, a lot of episodes of violence. So we know we're not the first ones to see that. Uh, I can remember as of March, I will have been a prosecutor for 27 years, and I can still remember March of 1997 becoming a juvenile prosecutor in Walker County and uh, just being shocked by some of the crimes that were committed by juveniles. I can remember walking the streets with a juvenile prosecutor trying to find a place for a kid to live because uh, the juvenile committed an act of violence against one grandmother and was stealing from the other one. So I understand all the frustrations that go along with the, the kids that you're serving, but we can never forget that some of those juveniles are there for, for violent reasons. Um, with Obviously, from our experience with 2007 and TYC, we know that TJ... Uh, we know that SBU was brought into this process to fulfill a similar function as we were already doing for TDCJ because of abuse by staff. I don't know of any facility. I've been, as I said, a prosecutor for a long time. And any organization working with kids is, I hate to say it, a bug light for those that, that want to work with kids for nefarious reasons. And so uh, no matter the best of practices, we're still always going to be have, have to be hyper vigilant about those that want to come and and hurt kids, and particularly in correctional facilities where you have an extra vulnerable population just due to the fact that being uh, there for committing felonies, uh, that makes them hard to take seriously, right, as, as victims, except we know that that's not true. We know that there's a reason that predators prey on kids, particularly in correctional facilities. Um, and then another big uh, issue for us is contraband, particularly with TBCJ, and this is one of those things that isn't really a big problem for you, uh, and, and that's that's a good thing because right now it's a it's a real challenge for TDCJ. But those are kind of the three areas that we focus our prosecution on. Um, moving on to page six, uh, there is uh, just a little bit of history of uh, how we came into this in 2007 when TJJ uh, that's when SPU was brought into the this this sort of oversight role. Uh, and then, of course, in 2011, the legislature combined TJJ, TYC and the Texas Juvenile Probation Department into what is now TJJD, uh, as y'all know. Um, and again, that stemmed from sexual abuses primarily that were occurring and, and sort of going uh, un, unpunished. Uh, moving on to page seven, though, this is where I really wanted to dig in. Um, I really wanted to, to visit with you about this, this TJJD SPU partnership. There's not a person in this room right now that's not here because you want to act in the best interest of a juvenile, whoever that juvenile is. In fact, the law requires that of us as juvenile prosecutors to act in the best interest of that child. It requires that of TJJD, it requires that of, of everyone working with these juveniles. And so that's the first thing to know when we start looking at the you know, what is the goal? What is the, what are our aims in, in dealing with these cases? It must always start there. A little bit different from criminal uh, prosecution of adults and that our sole goal there is public safety. Uh, not sole goal, I should say. I mean, certainly rehabilitation plays into that and deterrence. But when we start looking at juvenile cases, the primary goal is to serve, work in the best interest of the child. Um, but I think that also means that you have to balance rehabilitation with public safety. And I just want to tell you, uh, thank you, first of all, for your appointments of Chief Guajardo and, and Chandra as your executive director, uh, because I think they're doing a fantastic job. From the person looking outside in, uh, I can tell you it has been fantastic to work with both of them. Uh, before Danny Forrest Mitchell was uh, we work closely with him as, as your chief, and I think between him and, and Danny, they have really given you a first-class police agency. So know that. As somebody that's worked with a lot of police departments, you got to know that you've got a good police department, a good inspector general's office 
It's doing great stuff. And I also want to commend uh, Shandra Carter and her staff um, since they've come on and, and grabbed the reins. Um, things have really uh, been trending in the right direction and really good. Um, and I think it's because of this understanding uh, of what we're here for, understanding what they're here for, and a lot of communication, a lot of uh, transparency. Um, I would say Chandra is very passionate in what she's doing, along with her staff. I keep saying Chandra, but I know there's others in the room that are, are part of that. Um, but also, um, just again, that ability to communicate, but also knowing kind of that we're all shooting for the same goal, which is the best interest of the, of the child. Um, and so and that, that manifests itself in a lot of ways. And, and, um, and I think mostly it's understanding that balance of public safety and rehabilitation. Let's really focus on the kids that really do need to be prosecuted, that really do need to be removed from the population so that your other juveniles really can flourish. Um, but also, and I, I added this to the slide, it's no small thing. Many of you have heard of the Supreme Court versus Brady versus Maryland which is um, a case we talk about in mostly in criminal cases where we have to, the state is required to disclose to the defense uh, information that is mitigating, information that is uh, potentially exculpatory about a kid's offense, uh, information that is impeaching. Um, in any case, and if we're going to be successful in prosecuting any case, um, it's critical for us to have a good picture of what this kid's about. And so I focus here on the word mitigating because a lot of times uh, we don't know all that, that needs to be known. And TJJD is full of information. As I said, so many people have touched that kid long before they ever got to TJJD. So many police officers, so many juvenile probation officers, judges, prosecutors, and everyone has sent that information to TJJD. And it's a lot, you know, sometimes thousands of pages of information. And so having that ability to work with TJJD administration to really get a better picture of that kid, to understand that juvenile before we make a, a good decision on whether we're going to go forward on a case or not. Because sometimes prosecuting means not prosecuting a case. And I think Jana's going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, but in all of those areas, I want to say uh, your executive staff really understands these notions and has really been terrific to work with in, in helping us understand a picture of a juvenile, that particular juvenile, and painting that picture for us. So with that, I want to uh, introduce you to Jana again. Uh, Jana is, has been an attorney. Is, I, I've listed her, her resume there. She probably doesn't, is not happy that I did that. But I, I wanted you to understand, as the person that's primarily making decisions for us on behalf of SPU, uh, she is not uh, just some lawyer that we brought into this that, uh, you know, that we give a paycheck to and say, go play whack-a-mole with a bunch of kids, okay? Uh, Chana is, has been uh, an attorney for 33 years, but I think more valuable to us than anything, she's been an elected DA, so she understands uh, the gravity of these cases. But is th the thing I love the most is that Jana also has a master's in social work, so she really... Uh, a lot of juvenile prosecutors around the state, you know, come in, they're new, pro it's your newest prosecutor, like I was, that barely understands uh, what they're doing and trying to figure out just the, what they can about juvenile law, but hasn't, haven't been seasoned and understand uh, the importance of all the criteria that can go into making a decision on whether to charging, charge a kid and whether to go forward with a kid. So we're really fortunate to have someone with Jana's expertise and experience and then educational background to understand whether this kid needs to go forward and how that case needs to go forward. Uh, was this kid having a bad day on, you know, their transition into TJJD? Is this kid a, a potential sexually violent predator? You know, is what, what is it about this kid that, that needs to get our interest in with that in mind? What do we need to do going forward? So <clears throat> without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Janet to tell you a little bit more about the division. Uh, we do get pretty far in the weeds with the process, because I think we were asked to, to talk to you a little bit about our process. Um, don't let us pull you down too far. Feel free to tell us, okay, we get that, and let's move on, and again, feel free to interrupt. So, Janet, why don't you take over from this point? Okay, thanks, Jack. Um, I want to start by saying how much I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. 
Um, and we're gonna pick it up on slide nine. Um, so there are six of us at SPU that do these juvenile cases, um, including two people that um, are sexual assault prosecutors. So when we have those cases, particularly against staff, they're the ones that are gonna be handling that. Um, those other prosecutors, other, um, I, so there's four of us that have the, the caseloads and, and um, I'm the only one that just does juvenile. So they also have TDCJ responsibility. So quite a bit of cases. Um, we have four investigators and two legal assistants that also uh, are assigned to that division. Um, on page 10, we, I start talking about um, the typical cases that we're gonna be prosecuting involving juveniles. Um, most of our cases are assault public servant or harassment of a public servant. Um, when we start looking at those cases, we also look at, is it possible to charge it in a different manner, possibly injury to the elderly on an assault? Um, mm -hmm. Because we do have some uh, TJJD employees who are 65 or, or, or older, and that could certainly um, result in an injury to the elder, elderly. Um, we're looking at sexual assault and decency cases, prohibited item or substance in a correctional facility. And uh, Jack mentions we don't have uh, near the issue at TJJD that they do at TDCJ in terms of drugs and contraband. Um, so we typically are going to see um, some um, instrument that they've made into a weapon, possibly prosecuted under that. Um, sometimes some cell phones or laptops, if they've taken that away from a, uh, somehow confiscated that from a, a JCO office or something. Um, and then occasionally we'll have a burglary of a criminal mischief if they have broken into an office or um, torn up something at the facility. Uh, primarily they're felonies though. Um, we are starting to prosecute uh, a few misdemeanors in respect to um, youth who are already um, determined as sentence offenders. On page 11, uh, these are typically what we're seeing with staff cases. Um, of course, the sexual assault, indecency, uh, improper sexual relationship with a person in custody. Those are the five alarm fires that we're going to have our sexual assault prosecutors looking at. I'm going to be looking at those. We're going to staff those um, with OIG. Typically, we're involved in those types of cases from the very beginning. So as soon as that happens, they're reaching out to us to let us know it's happened. We may also be interfacing with um, TJ, TJJD admin to talk about those. Um, but those are the, the kinds of cases that quickly um, we're hoping to be involved with. Um, Danny mentioned official oppression. These are these are troubling to me. Um, because the way the statute reads, they're harder to make. Um, so if we get an official oppression, we're looking to see, can we possibly charge it differently? Um, also official oppression are misdemeanor cases and they're, they go in the district court, but it's just a misdemeanor offense. So we're always gonna be looking at um, what else we could charge on those cases. And then of course, any kind of aggravated assault or injury to a child, which would apply, the injury to a child would apply to um, a child that's under 15. So on page 12, this just kind of talks about our process. Um, of course, OIG conducts their investigation and depending on the nature of the offense, it could take um, you know several months, three or four months to investigate th that case, um, particularly given their um, large caseload, which you heard about earlier. Um, while they're doing their investigation, they may consult with us, um, especially if it's something that is more serious, uh, not quite run of the mill in terms of facts. Um, we also assist them. We review their search and arrest warrants typically, um, and we may even help to draft those for them uh, if it's a, a particularly um, difficult case. Um, then at some point they're going to submit that case to us and one of my prosecutors uh, is going to review the case and make a decision about um, whether or not we accept it or decline it uh, or send it back for more investigation. 
So we, we are trying to have an ongoing conversation with OG about that. Um, slide 13 talks about our decisions, but this is also kind of um, how we look at cases. So again, we may request additional investigation. It's any process during the, the, uh, the case. Um, we make a decision about whether or not we're gonna proceed on it. And then once we do that, we're subpoenaing records from TJD. Um, if it's a kid, we're getting employment records. If it's staff, we're gonna get medical records of the victim if they sought treatment outside of the facility. Um, and then kind of look at all that in the big picture and, and decide uh, what's most appropriate in terms of the prosecution on this case. Um, if it's an adult case, so if the kid is 17 or older, when they reoffend, we're gonna take that case to the grand jury and it's gonna proceed just like any other adult case would in a criminal court. If that um, youth is a juvenile, so under 17 when they reoffend, then we're gonna uh, file some type of petition either indeterminate, uh, which would result in an indeterminate commitment or a determinate sentence, uh, which requires us going to the grand jury. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that uh, in just a minute. So on page, uh, or slide 14, uh, these are some of the things that we're looking at. Uh, Jack referred to this a little bit, but we're gonna look at the facts of the case. I mean, we do we have, um, element that constitute a criminal offense, number one. Can we go forward? Um, and within that, what is the strength of our evidence and, and the strength of our witness testimony? Um, and then what do we know and believe or believe versus what we can prove? So um, we may know that something happened. We may believe that a kid, for example, is involved in a a combination or a group that plan to assault um, uh, a JCO. And so we're looking at an engaging and organized criminal activity, but can we prove that? Um, then we also need to consider the, the difference in probable cause because that's the, um, the um, what law, law enforcement has to go forward and, and make an arrest on a case. So that's, you know, generally what a reasonable person would believe that a crime has been committed or that this person committed that crime um, versus um, our burden of proof at trial, which is beyond a reasonable doubt, which is the highest burden of proof that we have. So often there's certainly enough evidence to um, arrest someone and even to get them indicted through a grand jury because they have the same standard of probable cause, but we may not have enough to um, meet our burden of beyond a reasonable doubt. And then we, we also somewhat consider the jurisdiction and the particular court that we're gonna be in, because we know through our experience that um, those tend to vary in their attitudes about TJD youth and um, just juveniles in general. Um, so we always keep that in mind. Um, then the circumstances and progress of the youth, uh, particularly what has happened with this kid since the offense. And this is where it's really been important in our partnership with TJJD to have those open conversations. We may talk to a case manager, or we may talk to a treatment provider. Um, we may I may talk to the executive director about the kid um, and, and see, see kind of what's going on and what are y'all thinking? Um, I talk to people on the RRP staff. They communicate with me frequently. Um, so it's really helpful to have those um, open conversations and that um, ability to kind of inquire about the progress of the youth. Um, then, of course, we consider public safety versus the continuing violence that the youth may or may not be um, exhibiting. And we look at their criminal history, particularly in deciding whether or not a uh, determinate sentence or certification might be appropriate if they're still um, a juvenile. So again, the next slide just kind of talks about our options. If they're 17 or older in terms of punishment, um, they can go to TDCJ. And most of our kids do um, if they reoffend at that age. Um, however, they're all probation eligible under the law and um, in some of our counties, um, particularly uh, in Hidalgo County, um, the judges, a lot of judges down there are more inclined to um, give them probation. Um, 
And then if they're under 17, we have the, um, our, our options basically are to recommit for an indeterminate um, or to go forward with a determinate offense. If we have one of those offenses listed under Texas Family Code 53.045, or if we have habitual felony conduct. And so, you know, I told you that most of our cases are um, assault on public servant or harassment of a public servant. So those are not offenses that are listed under 53.045. So we have to have the habitual felony conduct in order to go forward on a determinant there. So if we don't have that, um, then our option is just to, you know, recommit on another indeterminate and kind of wait the kid out. Um, so that um, is something that we're have looked at or talked about in terms of uh, legislation to maybe help that along. Um, and then the last thing is certification if they're age appropriate. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about certification at the end, but this is um, more difficult because a lot of our experts um, are reluctant to say that our kids are sophisticated and mature enough to be certified. Um, they're also costly because we have to have a full diagnostic done. And those, let me just say, those can run you. Um, and, and those are at our expense. They come out of our budget. Um, so we uh, have to consider all that when we're looking at what to do in terms of punishment. So slide 16 talks a little bit about determinate sentence transfer or release hearings. Um, so if TJD is wanting to release a kid, if they're doing well, they're on a determinate sentence, um, but they haven't satisfied their statutory uh, minimum period of confinement, then they have to request a release hearing from a court. Um, however, if that statutory minimum period of confinement has been satisfied, they don't have to go back to the court. They can release that kid on parole um, at the point that TJD feels comfortable doing that. However, if they want to, um, if a kid is not doing well and they want to request a transfer to TDCJ or what we call a transfer hearing, um, then they must have a hearing uh, with that court. And again, I'll talk about that process in just a second. Um, hang on, I think I got ahead of myself here. So slide 18 um, talks a little bit more. Um, we get uh, questions often about um, why can't y'all just send somebody to pen if they're acting out? I mean, why can't you, why can't you just, you know, like ship them? Uh, I know Shander gets those questions. Um, so there are several pathways from TJD to TDCJ for our really violent youth. Um, in terms of determinate sentence, that is certainly one way to do it. Um, but again, you've got to have that either enumerated offense or, or habitual felony conduct. You can't do it for a new state jail felony. Um, there are no age minimums, so that is good news about determinant. So if you had a 12 year old that was exceptionally violent, you could use this. I'm not sure I've ever used this for a 12 year old, but it's allowed legally. Um, that petition has to be approved by the grand jury. So you draft your petition and then you take it to the grand jury and you go over those facts with them, just like you would for an indictment. And the reason for that is because potentially they could be transferred to um, TDCJ at some point on a transfer hearing. Um, so when you they're committed, they're committed for um, a term of years. And um, there are several ranges of punishment that are a little bit different than, than the adult ones, uh, but it's up to 40 years. Uh, now, for the, prim the most of the cases that we're dealing with, since they're third degree felonies, assault public servant, harassment public servant, um, that's um, up to 10 years in the penitentiary for those. But the way the commitment uh, reads in the, the paperwork and the way the judge pronounces it is that it's for a determinate uh, term of years. So let's say eight years determinate sentence with possible transfer to TDCJ. Um, and that's that's the way that it actually uh, is pronounced and reads in the judgment. Um, so I mentioned a transfer hearing earlier um, that TJJD has to request the court in order to do a transfer hearing to TDCJ. Um, mm -hmm. And this is, you know, obviously going to be if you've got a kid who's been placed on a determinate sentence, they're continuing with their violent and aggressive behavior. Um, and so 
I'm sure y'all are aware that TJJD prepares a red packet. It goes through several hands and review um, before it ultimately um, ends up with the executive director. And then um, that letter comes from Chandra to the court, the committing court, requesting that hearing. Um, we're notified um, typically that a red packet's in the works and certainly when it uh, is completed, if that's what the decision is. And um, in order to have a transfer hearing, that youth must be uh, at least 16 years old. And that hearing, once the court receives the notice, um, must be held within 60 days of that request. And that's uh, back in front of the judge. There's no jury for that hearing. And then the judge may um, transfer that youth to TDCJ to serve the remainder of that determinate sentence. So I'm on um, slide number 21, that talks about another pathway and that certification. And we, um, you might hear certification you may used, you may use discretionary transfer, you may use um, certified to stand trials an adult. People use all sorts of words for this, but basically, um, the juvenile court who has exclusive jurisdiction in all juvenile cases um, has a hearing and then decides to transfer, waive their jurisdiction and transfer that youth to adult district court. So these minimums do apply. Remember, I told you that on determinate sentence cases, uh, there are no age minimums, but in certification, um, the kid has to be at least 15 um, for any a degree of felony. Um, other than a, a capital first degree or aggravated controlled substance. And then you can certify them for those uh, at age 14. And again, it requires um, a complete diagnostic assessment so that the court can uh, be assured that, you know, an expert has examined this child and determined that it's appropriate. And there are certain um, um, stipulations or qualifications that that expert has to find as to the youth, one of them being that they are um, sophisticated and mature enough, which is where we always kind of hang up. Uh, they look at the nature of the offense. They look at some other things too, you know, how severe the offense is. But um, that's uh, one of the biggies that our experts seem to have uh, a difficult time. In, and I'm sure you can understand with the nature of what some of these kids have been through. Yes, they are, ex you know, many of them exceedingly violent, um, however, um, then when you look at where they've come from and um, their maturity and sophistication, uh, a lot of experts just have a difficult time determining that um, some of these kids will meet that qualification. So, um, do y'all have any questions? I now ran through that really fast. Does anyone have any comments or questions? I don't really have any questions, but I do have a comment. Have a comment. I just want to say thank you to you and your unit because it's so important, vitally important, to keeping maintaining safety in our facilities, both for the staff and for the youth. And uh, the, it, just looking at Chief Guajardo's report uh, on the cases referred to SPU, you can tell that um, you all are busy and that you're taking care of business, and we gratefully appreciate that. Well, thank you for that. We we do stay busy and. Uh, uh, obviously, it would be great if our caseloads were a lot smaller because that tells a, a different story as well. But um, but I do think that that things are not going unnoticed, and I do think that that these cases are are getting handled appropriately. So and thank y'all for the excellent presentation today. You know, for six years I've been on this board, and we see SPU on all kinds of reports, but. We never really knew exactly, you know, the ins and outs of what y'all do. And thank y'all. Y'all do a great job. Well, thank you for the opportunity to visit with you. And thank you for all that you do. Because this is, it's just as important sitting in your chair. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're on item number seven, public comment. And I don't believe we have it. Okay. And item eight is to adjourn. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion, James. Second. 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 Okay. And we are adjourned. Thank y'all very much.